Hello everybody, James here, Franchise Universe, I nearly damn said story time with Dutch Mantel, I do so many of the <laughs> damn it, uh, Franchise University with Shane Douglas, of course, episode 20 something, because we were arguing, not even arguing, we were like, you said to me beforehand, what episode is this, and I went, I don't know, Yeah, can't work it out. <laughs> I think it's 22, anyway. And, finally, after so many weeks, we're going to be getting to part two of Halloween Havoc 89, the very first Halloween Havoc WCW ever did, because it was WCW, not NWA. Now, we watched this a few weeks ago. How fresh is it? You've got a better memory than me, so... No, no, fresh. I, I, I can remember the matches uh, fairly well. Uh, now, if you'd have just said, like brought it up as a conversation piece, I'd have had no idea. But but the, the cobwebs are still in there, but less. Well, we're going to crack on. Just before I do, I messed up a couple of weeks ago, so now I've got to say the email every single time now. Shane Douglas questions at gmail.com for future episodes of Fan Questions. Yeah. We've got one coming up next week. I was so annoyed with myself when I got that one wrong as well. So <laughs> Shane Douglas questions at gmail.com. Uh, you're a bit too late, I'm afraid, to say for next week's episode. The script is already written, but subsequent episodes, send your emails in and the best ones will make it into the script. Now, having said that, we're going to get to part two of Halloween Havoc 89. And we start off at the Stein Brothers versus Doom with woman Nancy. Um, I'm trying to think if she was Nancy Sullivan at this point. When did she marry Kevin? Oh, I believe prior to this. Yeah, she was with Kevin from the time that Kevin was uh, uh, b -b -b 80s, mid late 80s, maybe even earlier. I think she came into the business when she was like 16. And, uh, it, it, you know, we were talking about this before <laughs> saying, you know, we were hanging out with Kevin Sullivan and Purple Haze and all these guys, you know, King I can. You know, it's, you know, probably not the best uh, schooling, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Uh, having said that, because Woman's actually accompanying Doom here, it wouldn't last very long because Kevin Sullivan was actually meant to accompany Doom, but WCW management pulled him from managerial duty. And I think of when we talk about Nancy, we the first thing we all think about is her terrible end, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a, yeah. you know, it's a, a sad thing especially when just career wise and on television wise she had a really interesting career as an on-screen character she was a valet for a lot of people she was in ecw she valeted the sandman like my first ever tape of ecw that she was a uh, november to remember 95 i think yeah which you weren't on because i think you were still in wwf at the time but having said that why don't we put away the bad stuff and let's talk about the good stuff about Nancy as a person and as a uh, on-screen character as well. Yeah. Well, first of all, not, not saying anything anybody out there is not aware of, an extremely beautiful woman, right? I mean, she uh, wrestling at this time was trans, uh, transforming. It, it was going from, you know, women valets and, uh, you know, like the baby doll types who were great and, what they, and how they pursued their approach to the business. But suddenly now, like Miss Elizabeth and 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 woman and Nancy, uh, uh, later would come the advent of the Francines and the Beulahs. Uh, you know, wrestling is, as we all know, it, it long since been called uh, soap opera for men, right? And so I can't imagine any 13, 14 year old girl or boy out there saying, oh man, look at these incredibly beautiful and uh, talented women. Uh, I don't want to watch. I'd rather see a guy wrestle some, some big old ogre guy with a ward over here and a big old beer guy. You know, it's. Uh, but she was also very intelligent. You know, that's the thing that that always struck me was you could sit down with her and have a conversation on a wide range of topics. You know, and and I I, I was always mystified by that because once I later found out that she had come into wrestling at such a young age. Uh, which, you know, we've talked in previous episodes about you know, the debauchery of the bubble that we live in. Uh, she, uh, you know, she had her own course that we all do, but you could sit down and have a conversation with her about politics, about religion, about this, about that. And, you know, and, and, and not just be a, a, a surface level uh, or surface deep conversation. You could get into to real deep conversations with her. She also had this uh, almost like Manx cat uh, ability to defend herself. Like she, she was not a shrinking violet at all. And, you know, she would, uh, she knew how to handle, you know, some drunk guy in a bar. She knew how to handle some, 
overly zealous fan at the airport uh, and, and, and handled it far more tactfully than most, most of us would. Uh, so it, it's, you know, again, with, without getting into the, the, the tragedy of the end, uh, I think there's a whole lot more to Nancy that, that fans out there would be surprised to find out. Uh, and if you haven't dug into Nancy and researched it for the, for the viewers out there, I would suggest you do because there's a, there's a lot of tales that are, oh, my God, I wouldn't think that. Geez, that's different. Uh, you know, it's, it's a really in-depth story about this young woman. And uh, one of the people that helped, you know, for all the divas that there are today, and we hear that, that term so often, you know, there's the old saying, you stand on the, sh the, the shoulders of giants. Uh, and for all the women in the business, you need to look back to the, uh, to the Nancys and to the uh, Medusas and the Sherry uh, Martells and the Moolahs as to, to providing that foundation that suddenly opened that door, flung it wide open. And some could argue in many cases that the Divas division is probably more popular than the men's division. So that all started with all those names I just mentioned and several others I'm sure I'm missing, uh, Wendy Richter and you know so many others like that. But uh, uh, you know, Nancy, again, it's like the, 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 the oft refrain in this business gone too soon. Uh, you, you wonder what Nancy would have been able to accomplish if Nancy were still around and able to divvy off some of her wisdom and what she had learned and experienced to these young divas. Uh, it's just, you know, once that book is closed and put on the shelf, uh, that's it. That's the end of it. Unless some of these young ladies go start digging out and looking for that book. Hey, I heard there's this, this uh, fountain of information about uh, the early years of diva them. Uh, Check it out because Nancy was, uh, like I said, uh, not a shrinking violet and a lot more complex than people would imagine. Who do you think was Nancy's best charge? Like, who were the best pairing, Nancy and so on? Because uh, obviously she was with Benoit, Kevin Sullivan, we're talking on screen, Kevin Sullivan, uh, the whole host of people down in Florida, Doom, briefly. I remember Ric Flair. She managed Ric Flair for a time in 96 in the early days of Nitro along with uh, like Deborah McMichael and Miss Elizabeth, I think. Sure. And that was yeah. a really, uh, that was a great like little group. I thought that was a really good presentation. But who do you, uh, Sam Man, of course, uh, who do you think uh, Nancy worked with best? Well, I'm, I'm partial. <laughs> I thought she was great with all of them. You know, she, uh, again, you know, you've got this, this beautiful gal standing ringside, not, a, not especially hard on the eyes, right? Uh, but to me, that's like the, the shiny bobble that, that draws your attention. And you know, you're constantly looking at these little nuanceful things. I thought she was great when she was with Kevin, uh, uh, uh great later with doom and all that. She, she knew what she was doing. Uh, and I thought she gave a lot of element to Chris Benoit that Chris himself didn't have, but you know, obviously I'm partial, but I thought with Sandman, you saw Nancy a lot more out in the forefront. It was almost like Nancy was orchestrating that whole thing and uh it, it, it worked somehow you know, almost this beauty and the beast sorry hack but uh it's almost this beauty and the beast aspect of uh, of you know, you've got this gorgeous woman out there and this chain smoking beer swilling cane swinging crazy guy uh you know but again nancy nancy could have gone out there with you and 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 done great you know she she knew what she was doing i you know, credit that back to, I'm sure, with a lot of other different, uh, maybe more negative influences, uh, Kevin Sullivan and Purple Haze and, and, and IAK and all those guys, all the other stuff aside, all three of those guys had a really strong grasp of the psychology of our business, the storytelling in our business. And you couldn't help if you're Nancy sitting around 25 hours a day with these guys, picking some of that up. So Nancy definitely knew her way around this business. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get to Doom themselves. Ron Simmons and Butch Reader refer to as Doom 1 and Doom 2. I mean, wasn't Ron Simmons just in the promotion as Ron Simmons? And then all of a sudden you put a, like a thin mask on him and it's like, who the fuck yes. is this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah WCW was good for that. Like the Midnight Rider with Dusty Ray on the NWA at that <laughs> No, but they were uh, playing this one straight. That's the thing. The, like the like Midnight Rider and, and, and Brian Pillman, Yellow Dog kind of thing. But uh, yeah. it, here we go. The actual match themselves, is they, uh, they're they still masked and the fans aren't meant to be able to figure them out. Uh, as big as they are, anyway. Uh, the standards take over early, including tandem German suplexes. I won't go through the entire match, but I, right. as I say, this is a few weeks ago, but I remember this being one of the standout matches because as a fan, what you want to see is just, just four big people smash yeah. each other's faces in. And this is exactly yeah. what you got. Sure, and, and and it was at that time where the 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 uh, what has become the legend of the uh, Steiner brothers 
begins to coalesce, right? You, you had Scotty. You remember when Scotty first came in, he said the dark hair and was doing the hurricane run, the Frankensteiners and all of that. Uh, very different styling than, say, Rick's. Uh, and, and both of them have di different approaches to the business. But can, you know, when you say that thing you said about, the, you know, you want to watch four big men doing this stuff. Uh, Terry, Back to Terry Funk, you know, to, to bring him up again. Uh, he said to me when I was first starting the franchise character, uh, Shana, you have to ask yourself, you were walking down a dark alley in the middle of the night and a woman was coming from the opposite direction. Would she freeze in her tracks and stop and turn around and go the other way? Ooh, it looks like trouble coming. Or would she say, go walk away, hey, how you doing, bud? You know, have a good night. And and I totally got what he meant by that. These guys, you could, I dare say, probably most men in that dark alley with any one of these four guys, probably go, eh, eh, maybe I'll just go around the block. Uh, it's, you know, and, and that was the one thing I think that WCW at that time had, you know, to be fair, WWE or WWF then had their share of monsters as well. But the big guys in WCW could move around. They could go, you know, you, you see a guy like Scotty as big as he was, you know, still able to hit that Frankensteiner, albeit less often as he would previously. Uh, Rick has always just been a, just an immensely powerful guy. And Ron Simmons and Bush both, you know, speak for themselves as well. So, uh, you know, that, that was the kind of stuff to me that, that you know, in WCW, uh, in my head anyway, it always seemed more like the wrestling promotion. This is the, the working promotion. Uh, North is the uh, entertainment uh, uh, division. Uh, but you never got the feeling in watching Butch or Ronnie or uh, uh, Rick or, or Scotty that they were – just four guys that go out there and hit a tackle and not sell it or beat their chest or whatever. Uh, these guys could go to, to a pretty good degree, as most of the big men in WCW could. So, uh, you know, in looking back on that, you know, at that time, that kind of a match was having trouble breaking through to the top because you still had your flares and, you know, pretty close to prime and, and your steamboats and all these other guys that would be in and out of there uh, through the NWA lineage. Uh, but you look back at it now, and, you know, we often hear this refrain of, you know, the best big man or, the, you know, the, and attributing these these qualities because of the sizes that they are, they can still move around, uh, much like in the NFL. You know, you look at the speeds of the guys running in the NFL that are 320 pounds. It's like superhuman. You know, it's incredible what they can do. This, uh, I think, was the platform for that. You know, and, and back in the late 80s and early 90s, WCW was coming up with this, this brand, this flavor that somehow showcased these bigger men and showed them they could do things that the big guys in, say, WWF couldn't uh, or re refrain from. So, uh, and, and it doesn't hurt the fact that I, you know, all four of these guys are, are good friends of mine. Uh, B Butch was just a little comment about Butch because of his passing. Extremely quiet guy, very reserved, and not, not in like an off putting way or a hey, don't want to talk to you kind of way. He was a man of few words, uh, but, you know, he, he was the kind of guy that was straight up. If he had a problem with you, he'd come right to you and ask you about it. Uh, he was the first night that I'd gone to WWF and did those four jobs. He was match number three for me. And, you know, he's such a big, imposing guy. And I was such a little twig at the time that, you know, I was a little bit nervous going into that match. He was great. He was uber professional. Uh, and, and, you know, being on the road, like when you hear wrestlers talk about that, hey, he was a great guy, it was, you know, easy to be around, that kind of stuff. Understand that we were on the road for vast portions of our lives with these guys. And so if there's somebody you don't like or somebody just sort of grinds at you or whatever, the road can become monotonous and, and very, very long. Uh, most of those guys in the WCW dressing room, uh, locker room, like Butch, like Ronnie, like uh, uh Rick, and if he wasn't in his gremlin mode, uh, <laughs> or uh, or Scotty, they were great guys to be around, and it, and it made going to work fun. Not like uh, like in '95 going to WWF. Oh, oh got to go to work for another three days. It was it was a drudgery. With Butch, that being said, I always hear I say you always hear this because people don't bring up Butch very often when I ask this question, which is a. A question I ask a lot in a lot of my interviews is who are the toughest guys in the business? And they'll say Harley Race or Bruiser Brody or Andre or sure. whoever it may be, Meng or Haku, you know, obviously, or Barbarian. But some people have said that as tough as Ron Simmons was, Butch Reed was someone you never wanted to trifle with. 
Oh yeah, yeah. He, he again, like, he didn't wield that like over you or like, hey, get out of my way or else. It was never anything like that with Butch. But to me, again, what I just said about Butch, you know, being the quiet, reserved guy. You know, when I go into a bar, which ain't very often anymore, but when I used to go into bars and you'd have the guy over there running, hey, bye, I'm gonna fuck you, all that kind of stuff. I'll take him outside right now. Uh, the guy that's sitting over there in the corner, just sort of looking up over his glasses or you know under his eyebrows or whatever, not saying a word. That's the guy I'm keeping my eye on because you know, and that was Butch to to the umpteenth degree, and you know, just yeah. You know, again, with some of these guys, you know, gone. As we talk about them, it, it brings them back to life in my head, and you know, my overriding. When you ask anybody about any, ask me about any name, the first thing that pops into my head is, okay, what, what did I think of that guy? Um, and, and you know, and so often you'll hear from me, oh, this guy was a great guy. This guy was quiet. This guy was this or that. Uh, but it's rare you'll hear me say, oh, this guy was a flaming jackass, right? And I'll tell you that whenever I think the guy was. But, uh, you know, Butch was, you know, first of all, he had an NFL career, right? I mean, it was, this guy was tougher than nails. And, you know, in wrestling at that time, although we had other people that had come in from professional sports, uh, Butch was one of those guys that came from the NFL. I mean, it's the NFL is a, a huge uh, conglomerate here. And so, you know, you knew that, like, first of all, the NFL can't be easy to make a football team. It can't be easy to stay on that team and have had a, you know, a, a pretty prodigious career in the NFL uh, and then come into wrestling. Yeah, Butchie was a, uh, a tough guy, quiet guy, but never, ever a bully uh, uh, and, and quite articulate. Like, when you did sit down and talk to him, you know, he, he, he like I said, Nancy, you have a good conversation with this guy. You, know, you think, oh, you know, the, 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 you know, the caricature that we always hear about wrestling, our knuckles drag on the ground and we all scream and yell all the time. Uh, you know, that, that, that's the an uber stereotype of professional wrestling. Butch really fit into none of those other than he was just an impressive looking guy and, and, a, and a good human being. Before we get off this match, I can give you a couple of things about it. I mean, there's a there's a kick out from a stuffed pile driver, Scott kicks out, which for people complaining about that happening today, hey, it happened in the 80s as well. Yes. Uh, you know, some things, I th we could go on for that, but uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago about kicking out of finishes, but, you know, it's not brand new kind of stuff, this thing. Another thing I wrote down here I wanted to ask is, how did you wrestle the Steiner brothers and not get hurt and when i say <laughs> hurt i don't mean you know broken ankles and whatever busted ribs but how did you just not get a ton of bruises every time because they really laid that stuff in even i can see yeah, it and i've never felt it yeah they, they would definitely lay this stuff in but again there's a there's a physics lesson in every professional wrestling match right when done properly if you watch ricky throwing those stiff clotheslines he's hitting you in the right place you know he's not hitting you here he's not hitting you here He's hitting in the right place. And, and again, the quantum, the, the, the physics part of that is as that big, strong son of a bitch is, is throwing that clothesline and hitting you like that, that impact is, is not just you taking your bump. You're being thrown into the bump. It snaps the bump. Uh, but he always was aiming you know, fairly accurately. And, and Scotty, uh, to a lesser degree, but Rick was more the physical. Scotty, when he came in, was trying to like do some more of the flying stuff and everything. Uh, but both of them, I think, were far more powerful than they knew early in my career. First few months in my after I'd got my break in UWF, we were in the Centroplex in Baton Rouge. And I was wrestling Rick. And he called for the German. And, you know, so in our business, you're taught to go with it. You know, throw yourself into it. Well, I, I didn't have the realization at that time just how freaky strong Rick was. You know, I, I was probably 215 at the time. And he threw me like I was a piece of paper. And by going, by me throwing myself into it, his explosion with it came over and landed right on my head on the other side. And instantly my fingers and toes went, Z -Z -Z. You know, and I was afraid to try to move that I might not be able to. I thought I'd broken my neck. And, uh, you know, so after that, anytime Rick, you want to go over to German, I was giving the lead ass, you know, because he's still <laughs> going to get me. But he, I'm, I'm sure he's not going to dump myself on my head again. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've, you know, that's not the first time I've heard someone incredibly strong. You're going to go one way or another, so just let them. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're Because they, they're strong <laughs> enough to put you where you need to be in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the <laughs> match itself, Doom wins via pinfall. Nancy puts something in one of the 
Doom guys masks and headbutts. Apparently the uh, match wasn't maybe quite as well received by the audience watching at the time because a fight broke out in the crowd halfway through, which sort of took the uh, shine off the match somewhat as far as reactions go. Then... Yeah. From there, we go to Gordon Soli interviewing Lex Luger, and I've just noticed that Lex Luger has several scars on his belly. Wonder, hmm. wondering what that's from. Oh my lord! I'm, I remember a couple of the guys having, uh, like, with seatbelts, they have car accidents, and have Terry Taylor was one of them. Uh, boy, it's in the distant past. There, there, I do recall him having the scars. He also. I think that it, 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 it's going to be one of two things. Either it was a car accident or he'd had some liposuction done, uh, you know, just to keep that crafted in and, and that sculpted look. Uh, boy, I, I'm about to go back and re- It's funny how it's something like that that you think would stand out in your head. Uh, it, until you said it, I would have had no – if you said, like, which wrestler had scars on his belly, I would have could have never answered it. But now it's, like, sort of in the back of my head there. I remember because he had uh, – they had kept him off, off – in ring action for a while. Uh, any? Do you have any idea what it was? I mean, no, no, absolutely not. I I'd assumed that it maybe had like some mic, like keyhole surgery or something like that, but it didn't look right. Yeah. So I, I had no idea. No. Yeah, it's you know, Lex was you know the liposuction thing. I, I again, I can't. It's all mixed. Together. I can't remember if that was somebody else or. Uh, Lex, Lex, I'd be surprised if it was that because he was in such incredible condition, as the fans know. Uh, but he also, <coughs> excuse me, he also had these these little tricks, uh, these little gimmicks, you know, uh, hacks as we would call them today. Uh, he would later tell me, when you go to bed, turn the air conditioner as low as it can go and as high as it can go, uh, low temperature, high uh, fan so that the room stays as cold as it can because what that does is it your body has to maintain what's called homeostasis balance and 98.6 is where it has to stay so if you're in a room that's say 65 degrees the whole night your metabolism is staying up because it's got to to try to keep you up to the 98.6 just little things like that uh about let's but i will look into that and 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 get back because i'm i i know there's a story to it and i can't quite remember what it is also, he doesn't do this in this match, and I was looking at it, but there's a compilation out there on YouTube with with um, Lex where he's got a very peculiar tick going on in quite a lot of his things, and you don't know what I'm talking about, so I'll tell you what it is. Yeah. is he keeps plucking at his winky constantly through like promos <laughs> and matches. He'll get up and go, boop, and give his, and give his little Johnson a tug. It's like, did you ever notice <laughs> well, him doing that? I didn't notice him doing that, but I can tell you, <clears throat> wrestling tights, especially the, the you know, like I used to wear minus two inch rise. I think he was minus three inch rise, <laughs> which means off the waist, you know. Uh, they give you almost no support, you know, and, and none of the guys that I've ever seen wore jock straps or anything under it. Uh, so, you know, you, you're always, you know, because let's face it, if that gets in a certain position, and you start to get aroused for whatever reason, and you're in the ring in front of the crowd, could be quite embarrassing. In fact, that was one of my mortal fears when I got into wrestling was, mm. like, if you get get excited at the wrong time, it could be a little embarrassing. <laughs> so. we, we've got to ask Lex about that. So liposuction and the old the old dick pluck, we need to look into yeah. then. For yes. yes. We're gonna, in, in fact, the next match is, of course, yeah. US champion Lex Luger versus Brian Pillman. I'll admit straight away that I... I've seen a lot more of Lex in the 90s, you know, WWF and later, WCW yeah. than in NWA. I thought he looked really good and yeah. as good as he's probably ever looked in the ring. I mean, I've heard it said before that, like, late 80s NWA Lex is best Lex. Is that right? Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I mean, he was, you know, in his peak shape, of course. Uh, but Brian was uh, was... Uh, for lack of a better term, anal about his matches. You know, he wanted to really go. So I'm sure he and Lex had really worked on some of that stuff and everything. But that was, I thought, the exact same thing you did. Excuse me. Whenever I was watching the match, because it didn't stand out in my mind as being memorable or, you know, something that was forefront of my head. But when I did watch it, I thought the same thing. Like, Lex is, is he, he's holding his own, you know, and, and Brian could go. So, uh, but, you know, I'm sure Brian probably had a lot of conversations with him in doing that. 
And, and that to me shows, I think underscores my point about when the business started going bad. <clears throat> I apologize for this frog in my throat. Uh, was that it allowed us to descend down to our lowest common denominator. We just stick to the basics and do this and do that. All you have to do is, you know, a couple of moves and then stick into that. And nobody was coming in and getting anybody's ear and saying, hey, let's let it loose. Let's see what you can do. Uh, let's usually stay to that safe road, right? He had a sort of standard match that he would go through. Uh, but in this match, he, he very much had come out of that. You know, he, I rarely seen him working like that, which proves to me that he could work like that which proves to me that had he been prodded and pushed, we could have seen a lot more of that from him. And, and it's a shame that we didn't. <laughs> Having said that, actually, uh, with Pillman as well, I'll get back onto Lex in a minute, but 5-9 versus 6-4. But the way that there's certain people like Randy Savage and Brian Pillman, obviously, who are six foot or under, but carry themselves so much bigger to the point that you didn't really notice the height difference that much. Uh, right, height difference right. that much. And I think that's sort of credit to... Brian of how to project himself uh, bigger than he actually was. Yeah. Well, you know, and again, like for, for, I'm sure there's a few fans out there that aren't aware of this. <clears throat> Brian, <clears throat> shortly after birth, or maybe was born with throat cancer. Mm -hmm. And that's why he had that very raspy voice. He also had uh, this intense internal drive, having always been the runt, you know, that's smaller than everybody. And again, I was a runt in those dressing rooms too. Uh, you know, a, a guy that size came from a Division II school. Making the NFL was almost an impossible dream, like a fool's dream. And yet he did. And, and I'd spoken to some of his coaches, and it was because they would make comments similar to this. I've never seen anybody work harder than Brian Pillman. And, uh, you know, he, he was an incredible athlete. And the fact that he achieved what he did in his life, he, very few people get hit NFL WWF, WCW, you know, and all these other things. Uh, uh, he he had an amazing drive, uh, which is why he was so meticulous on his diet. Everything he did was to the 25th degree. And so, you know, how that would play out in just daily life, we'd be in a restaurant getting breakfast and he would, you know, really almost belittle the waitress, make sure there's no butter on that toast and I don't want any salt. And you tell the cook this and that and the other thing. And he had all these little sayings like white bread equals white death. Uh, you know, all those things that he would always, you know, spew about because it, Brian, like we, I've talked to you before about like where it worked. When we walk into that building, regardless we're in gear or in the ring, we're at work. That's our place of work. Brian took that. Don't get me wrong. Brian had his fun and everything as well. But Brian took wrestling incredibly seriously, and which is why you see this, uh, you know, the you know the loose cannon type of approach and and matches that were sometimes almost maybe even overdone because uh, you know, that's the way he approached life. He had started life with such a so many strikes against him. And somehow overcame those. He had an internal drive that I would think most people would be envious of. And, uh, and that's the way it would play out. Like when he would get into that ring, he would really work his ass off. So I, hopefully I've got my maths right here, but Brian Pillman was in the business for about two years at this point. Or he, wasn't, he was less than three, I'm pretty sure, because didn't he get in the revived Calgary Stampede a promotion in 87? So how come he's already basically a veteran plotting out matches and calling everything yeah well I, i'm not so sure but I'm, I'm again i'm trying to think back i know that ben Waugh was broke in the same year i did and i think pilma was either that year or the second next year so either 82 or 83 uh i'm pretty sure of that how he would be calling matches and have that sort of ring what we call ring generalship is you know the, the hearts as you can see with brett and and we saw later with owen uh that you know Stu was a big stickler on that stuff you know the way he taught and you know it's renowned of the you know the torture chamber down in the basement and everything uh you know those those guys much like ricky steamboat would teach to me later uh it's not the it's not the high spots, high spot A, B, C. It's the segues, the linkages between those. How do you segue from A to B to C to keep that storyline consistent and keep all that thing threaded together? Uh, Calgary was because of Stu was very very strong on that. And so you go back and look at the names that came through Calgary. Uh, 
you know, like Neidhart. Uh, uh, you know, it was more of the brawler style. Davy Boy Smith it, it had come through there vicariously through England. Uh, uh, Bret Hart, Owen Hart. Dynamite as well. Uh, Di- yeah, Dynamite as well, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm yeah. trying to think who else. Like Mike Shaw was there later. Uh, uh, Pillman debuted in November 1986. So this was about three years into his pro run. Okay, yeah. So, And this is 86 we're talking, correct? Yeah. As far as the... This pay-per-view is 89. 89. 89. Okay, so yeah. I mean, so he's got, what, six years in at that point? No, no, three. 86, November 86. Oh, he broke to... in in 86. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. See numbers and throwing dates at me early. It's no, I'm sorry. It. <laughs> so yeah, numbers no, are like Greek to me. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah. November '86 to October '89, and he's already sort of acting as a veteran of putting together matches, which is pretty incredible for someone of his experience. But I guess a stampede territory is a hot house, really. Owen yeah. Hart was the same, wasn't he? I mean, he seemed to be yes. one of those people who picked it up almost immediately, if not immediately. Yes. Yeah, and. You know, keep in mind that the, the you know the veterans in the business frowned on that. You know, if, you, if you're going to the ring with somebody that had like say ten or fifteen years experience and start calling stuff to that guy, they weren't very amenable to that. Uh, and, and yet somehow Brian made that all work. You know, it's you know the, the popping in out of the different places between his contracts and the whole loose cannon thing, and you know there's so much more going on there. You know that they can. Uh, I, I, I know we talked about it before. Steve Austin and I talking about uh, on his podcast several years ago about the, taking that six, seven year point before you started feeling comfortable. Didn't master it, but could be getting comfortable in the ring. So the idea of opening your mouth and calling something at three years in, boy, that that's that was ballsy. You know, that was really uh, really different in the business then. Why did? Lex Luger works so much better in WCW than he did in the WWF. So I, I know that you weren't watching WWF in 93. I thought, I don't know if other people would agree or not agree, but I thought that Lex Luger's best work was as the narcissist for about six months. Because uh, maybe for two reasons. One, he was bigger, so he just looked yeah. more impressive. And two, he really mm-hmm. leaned into the super arrogance, working slower, more character work kind of thing. Then he becomes the All-American Lex Luger. And for me, in my eye, uh, he slimmed down a little bit, so he didn't look quite as imposing. But also, the fans just didn't gravitate towards him like, obviously, Vince was hoping they would and be the next replacement to Hulk Hogan. And then they also had Bret Hart there, who was the fan's choice. So why did Lex struggle in WWF as compared to his WCW runs, where he seemed to just get over by doing nothing and people would love him? Yeah, well, in large part because of the body, right? I mean, he uh, uh, was trained under Matt Suda in Florida. Florida had the connection to the NWA. And when they brought him in, if you if you look back at it, them putting him in the four horsemen was really the safest place to have him because you've got Arn Tully and Flair there at one point only uh, uh, prior to that. You know, so that, that this is like... You know, great hot houses as, as to where we can keep an eye on, keep them close. And when you're in a, you know that kind of a, a group, you know, I could call stuff into you. You know, hey, clothesline and Lex, you know, whatever uh, from the apron. So uh, that would be my guess there. The other part is uh, coming from the WCW NWA faction into the WWF. Lex Luger, even though they changed the name, is not a creation of WWE. And Vince had this weird quirk that. Uh, and there, I know there are exceptions to it, but he had this weird quirk of, well, you came from the other company, so we really can't give you that Hogan push because it may show that they are better than we are. Just a little to witness this stuff. But, uh, and also up there, I think that there would have been a, uh, the consensus in the, dresser, in, in the dressing rooms in the industry at that time was that people like Lex, Ultimate Warrior, uh, guys like that, they were just getting those pushes just because, as if, you know, like it was just, yeah, I always love the way, oh, yeah, I took steroids or whatever. Well, you, when you take steroids, you're going to work your ass off twice as hard. You know, so you can't de- delete or detract from anybody for for, for that, especially in that industry. Uh, but the, the, the camps are now setting up at this time. In the, in, in the late 80s, you know, we're, we're seeing and into the early 90s where it's an us and them world. You know, you're either on that side or this side. And, you know, like what Vince, uh, you can't overstate it enough in, in his approach to this, how seriously he took that. You're one of them. You're one of us. And I think, you know, you've heard me talk before about, 
you know, you have to change to, to maintain up there, you know, to sort of morph into that mentality. And I think that's part of the reason why, you know, is that Vince is not going to give you that strap rocket to your ass, like Steve Austin would say, uh, unless he sees you've been indoctrinated into our system. You're, you're one of us now. And, you know, we've gotten rid of that back then. And, and the other part of this is Lex, and he'll be the first to tell you, he's not the greatest worker in the world. Didn't need to be, had that incredible body. So in a place like WWF, where there's a, you know, uber egos, and, and I have one too, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody, uh, you know, or talking bad out of sort on anybody. So there, there, I'm sure there would be a mindset in that dressing room up. Oh, one of the horsemen is here. Let's see what he can do, right? Instead of helping him, instead of going along and saying, hey, let's you know, let, you know, try this or try that or trying to protect him, they would be very reticent to accept him into that fold because they see him as, you know, we, we're finally getting Hogan toppled off that top. We're not going to watch another one scones right up there above us. And, you know, it's sad. That's the way the industry was and probably still is. Uh, but it definitely is that way. We'll get to a couple of notes I've written down on the match itself. So I've written down very aggressive, good with crowd manipulation here, although I have written his elbows on the floor looked awful, apparently. <laughs> but this was weeks ago. I can't remember what he looked like. He dropped his out. He, here we go. He dropped his outstretched arm onto Brian. So instead of dropping, yeah. he was doing like that kind of thing, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. I noticed this as well in the match with Brian is that Lex is constantly talking in the latter stages of the match. Is that something common yeah. Lex would do? Uh, well, there's to be fair, there's always a lot of conversation that goes in the ring. Some guy like Bobby Eaton just had this way, like this telepathy about him, <laughs> the way he used his body language. Uh, but you know, that's the, the quickest way to communicate. The more seasoned workers know how to do that a, a lot less noticeably, uh, whether it's through the office, you know, the double squeeze or, uh, you know, through <laughs> the manipulation of words, the headlock, you know, calling the spot there to that. Uh, Lex would have been one that was probably not so well versed in that because he never had to be. And my guess is by the end of that match, uh, they, having gone through stuff, which they would have had to have done, uh, knowing Brian, that he was probably getting to the point and asking, like, hey, what's next? Is this what we're supposed to do? Like, they, 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 just uncertain, like that deep into the match. And, and I'm sure you could feel it that they're having this pretty darn good match and he doesn't want to, you know, poo poo it off the rails. And that would be my guess. I have to, if I went back and watched it again, I could probably tell you with more certainty what exactly he was doing. To finish up uh, after a missed top rope drop kick, high risk for a reason as they say. I mean, there's nothing high risk anymore because everyone just gets up. <laughs> Lex Luger hits a hot shot on top rope on Pillman and Luger pins Pillman clean. Now we move to the back. Chris Cruz with the Road Warriors. Hawk says they've been underdogs all their lives. What? Yeah. Come on, come on. That's Crap. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, all right, well, whatever, Hawk. Anyway, uh, they've been uh, underdogs all their lives. I don't know where you got that one. Uh, lighting is terrible. Uh, if, we've already brought this up. The lighting in the back was yeah. awful. I didn't even realize yeah. Paul Ellering was in the back until about 10, 20 <laughs> seconds in because he was just, he just sort of, I don't know, just, just yeah. terrible lighting. Anyway, uh, I also wrote that, you know, the underdog warriors. As, as we're now probably going to be calling them, <laughs> were paid crazy money for back in the day, guaranteed contracts. Do you remember what they were getting paid in the latter days? I believe the, the number was somewhere in the 650 to 800 range, which was gigantic money then. This is each um, or both? Both, each, each of them. Each, each. Yes. And, and Ellering, I'm sure, wasn't far behind. You know, it's uh, uh, Paul, by the way, a super intelligent man. Uh, very, very much into the uh, uh, financials. Always walked around the Wall Street Journal on the cell, on the payphone all day long. And he carried a little graph tablet around with him. And he would chart out like each hour his stocks. Meticulous on this. Uh, I should should have paid attention to that, to that learning tree a little bit. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the lighting stuff. And I, again, like just draw the juxtaposition. When you watch WWF this time, and, and probably any time since Vince took over, their production was phenomenal, right? Everything was crisp and perfect. Uh, and then here's WCW chugging up behind, trying to do it on the shoestring budget and save money here and there. 
Uh, and, you know, and, and it, it, it bears out in places like that. Do you know Paul Ellering, Ellering is back in WWE again on screen? He's, I, he's the manager know. of um, Authors of Pain, I think. He he used to really? be the manager of them in NXT, and then when they went to the main roster, they got rid of Paul, and now Paul's back with them. So it's nice. He's 70 oh. years old and back uh, back on TV, which is cool. Good for him. I, I love Paul. Paul's just one of those guys you, know, you can sit down and have a great conversation with, uh, you know, and just the way he carries himself. You know, he, he's... Just a really, really cool dude. Okay, so the match itself, Road Warriors versus the Skyscrapers. During the entrance, Teddy Long talks to the cameraman instead of the camera, which I thought was a funny production thing. Uh, the Road Warriors have an incredibly close approximation to Iron Man, but on this one I could never quite tell if it was a network overdub or not. It's probably this time where they were transferring the music onto the library music, I think. And then... I've made the note that Danny Spivey is just a bad mother lover. I mean, all the stories I've heard about old, old Danny Spivey is... Uh, <laughs> I mean, Dan Spivey, Sid versus the Road Warriors. It's just like Doom and Doom and the Steiners. You know exactly what you're going to get, and that's not a bad yeah. thing. Yeah. There there was one thing that, as I remember sticking out to me, I looked at Moose because we were watching it a few weeks ago, and I said, why the hell do you do that? Uh, there was a point where it went into the four-way melee, and Sid and uh, Animal went face to face for a split second. I mean, literally half a second and started fighting. If they would have let that breathe for seven, eight, nine, ten seconds, the place would have percolated, percolated, and just exploded when they finally started going at it. Uh, you know, it's, it's there's things you catch in hindsight like that that you go, oh man, that would have been an incredible spot. Uh, a bit herky jerky towards the end, uh, but again, I think with with you know, the, like in my business, we always talk about: does it look like a dance? Or does it look like a fight? And no fight that I've ever watched in my life, you know, street fight, real fight, uh, ever looked like a dance. Right? It was knocked down, drag out, dirty, discombobulated, uh, and, and, and gnarly. And, and this had that feel at the end, a little bit sloppy for the wrestling side of things. But you know, you got the road warrior, the, you know, the underdogs all their life, road warriors, <laughs> and. Uh, and, and the Twin Towers, you know, I think they could have gotten a lot of a lot of distance out of that angle had they uh, pushed the right things in. The Road Warriors at this time, and I'll say up front, I love both guys. They were just really good dudes. Mike Hegstrom was so funny uh, without trying to be funny. You know, he's just like one of those guys. And, and Animal, I would tug at his chains all the time. We were in a uh, some small town of Santa Motel. He and I would travel together because we didn't party. I like going to the gym with him and that kind of thing. You know, and you travel to people that are similar to you. <clears throat> and this one day I just kept needling them, needling them, needling them. Right. And we finally get back to the hotel <clears throat> and I needle him. And he's putting me, he spins around and throws me on the hood of the car. And goes, you skinny motherfucker. You better shut the fight. It goes off. And then he goes into the bathroom. I know exactly what he's doing. He's embarrassed at himself. Right. So he comes out and I'm sitting on the end of the bed and I went, I'm sorry, Joe. I didn't mean to get under your skin like that. He goes, oh, I'm so sorry. He's like, I got you again. Good memories. With the Road Warriors, I've heard like two different versions of this where I can't remember who told me this. And I said, oh, you know, in the early days, how stiff were the Road Warriors. And someone told me, and I can't remember who it was. That's really going to bug me now who told me. And they went, yeah. they were never stiff. They were only stiff if they wanted to be. They were really good workers from the off. And if they stiffed you and then apologize afterwards, it's because actually they just wanted to stiff you a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, they, they, you know, J uh, Joe, I know, uh, I, I wrestled Hawk in single, uh, two singles matches in ECW. Uh, never wrestled Joe, but I, I could tell by watching him, uh, much like Bam Bam, and you see those, you know, if a tough guy wants to hurt you, this is what you're going to get, right? In the right place. This... You know, forearms and so you can hit somebody pretty darn hard in, in, in shoulder blades, chest, that kind of thing. Uh, again, the physics of it, you don't want to hit on any point or any, you know, bony protrusion. Uh, but th they would lay their stuff in, but not so it's what we would call snug in, in wrestling. And, and they both would tell you, if they were both standing here right now, they would say, Paul Ellering. You know, Paul read that into it because Paul knew that if he's going to latch his wagon to these guys, these two big, powerful human beings. 
Uh, they're not going to get much run if they're hurting guys and everything else. And so uh, Paul took it upon himself. You know, in, in wrestling, you know, we often think of wrestling managers as being just part of the act, right? They're just out there as part of the, the gimmick. Paul, uh, Paul Ellering was really their manager. He would negotiate their contracts uh, and would take them, you know, in those early years and, and tell them, like, you can't do this. They want nobody will hire you. And uh, so, yeah, you know, credit that back to Paul Ellering. And, uh, and, and again, I know Mike and, and Joe would both tell you that if they were standing here right now, because they told it to me several times. Road Warriors would take it to the skyscraper. Sorry, I'm chewing a sweet now. I move, uh, I move to note that we don't see often it's the power bomb into a helicopter spin. And Sid did it really well as well. Mm -hmm. um, Teddy Long then hits Ellering with a giant gold key. And the skyscraper, it, it sounds like almost like fan fiction, like writing wrestling, what I say. And a big gold key sort of comes in, in, into the thing. <laughs> yes. And then the skyscrapers use it on the Road Warriors for the DQ Road Warriors win for your disqualification. Then back to the back, Chris Cruz and Sting and Ric Flair and Ole Anderson says he won't throw the towel in. Flair says he will end Terry Funk. We'll get to the main event in a minute. I remember just, well, a few weeks ago, watching this as a fan, and I look at the footage from like 85 or 86, whenever the force horsemen joined up, and Ole Anderson looks like he fits. Fast forward yeah. a few years to 89. Ole Anderson doesn't look like he fits in there at all. Yeah, is that just me, or yeah. what did you think? No, uh, again, you know, you're look at those years you're looking at. Remember how I talked about everything's contemporary. You look through contemporary lens. Uh, when Gene and Oli were part of the Four Horsemen, there was this, uh, you know, this very, very old school mentality approach from those guys. And Flair was like the new kid on the block. You know, the the new great worker. Uh, by but by the late '80s, in large part because of WWF. Uh, it become it, it, business became far more aesthetic, and so you know guys like Gene and and Ole that were just these big bruising steelworker looking type of guys, uh, they, they weren't quite fitting anymore. And and they were you know, Gene was, was the older of the two, but Ole by the late eighties was starting to, to to creep up there in years. And suddenly you see this advent. We'll get rid of these guys, and here comes Alex Luger, and here comes this and that, and you know Ollie and Tar uh, Tully and Arn. Uh, you know, and, and that became the, the horseman that is so generally thought of, right? Like when you think of the horseman, it's that version of the horseman that you think of. Uh, Ole also was, was a, a, a huge influence in the office. And so, you know, being on the road and being in the office, uh, it, it's burning the candle at both ends. Uh, you know, when you're out on the road, it's, it's difficult if you're in the office, if you're the booker or, you know, on the booking committee or whatever, because now you're out here just running the road day to day. It's pretty hard to call back to Beth then again before the advent of uh, the ubiquitousness of cell phones. Uh, it'd be difficult to get back and forth. So what would happen was as the as the crew would go on the road, the decisions of what would happen in the house show matches were uh, supposedly allegedly made in the office that week or two prior and then divvied out and, and going back. And we had talked before about where there was a separation suddenly out in the field. Things were changing uh, from what the office wanted. This is where the brain had become disconnected from the body in WCW. And so we, we sort of had this renegade rolling of the company out in the field and to cover their asses when they would get back, they would say, oh, well, Shane Douglas wouldn't do this or that, or this person wouldn't this or that. And, you know, giving me a call, but guys like Jim Hurd or whoever was in charge at that time, weren't quite so well versed in that. Uh, Ole, uh, his stint as Booker there was not that long lived because he was trying to, like we've joked about before, like if Bill Watts, as much as everyone knows I respect him, he were booking today, doing those things. Now there'd be lawsuit after lawsuit and, you know, a whole lot of bad press. Uh, Ole was, was the forebearer of that. You know, he was trying to do what happened – they treat the industry and the wrestlers like it was still the 60s and 70s. And we're now in the late 80s, getting ready to approach into the 90s. And he told me one time that he didn't know what I was complaining about with my $300 a night uh, guarantee when I was with Ricky. Uh, because that's about what he made when I was that when he was that age. He'd never heard of inflation then. <laughs> yeah, apparently not. Right. So, yes. <laughs> Jeez. When I was looking at Ole, as, as I say, you know, back in 85, he looked like the grizzled old veteran, but by 89, yeah. 
Ric Flair's the veteran, and the younger guys around him, you know, like Sting, like right. in this time frame, you know, Sid and, and Barry Windham and um, Lex Luger, and, sure. and like, uh, and basically Rick and Arn are the veterans, and then you've just got this guy who looks about sixty in Oli, and yeah. probably the attitude of someone born in the eighteen hundreds, quite frankly. Right. In right. that sense, so uh, that one just stood out to me, and um, I actually brought this up as well on my on the on the web area oh, as well. Please, please one thing. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt no, you. No, please. Uh, there was one thing I wanted to mention about the promo with Oli. Yeah. Uh, for, for the fans out there, and hopefully pretty much everybody here is, when you're going back and watching that, listen closely. Those promos aren't just blocks put in the center there to fill up some time, right? They'd much rather fill that time up with action or whatever. But when those old timers like Oli would say something like, I guarantee I'll never throw the towel in. Yes. That little quip. I knew right there that they were going over. You know, because there's no way those guys it came from Bruno to me in the sense the way he verbalized it to me was never promise something you know you're not going to deliver. So just 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 the the, the franchise cheat key to, to watch it leading into matches. <laughs> I I actually want to com- compare back in '85 with the last flourishes of Thunderbolt Patterson, and when you see the footage of Thunderbolt Patterson in '85, and then you compare him to so much of the like high flying action and he looks he's a transplant from a bygone era and yes, then this is yeah. what I, Ole Anderson looked to me he was a transplant from a bygone era because for all intents and purposes he was I suppose in that sense yeah. now we're going to get to the Thunder Dome cage match Ric Flair and Sting with Ole Anderson versus Terry Funk and the Great Muta with Gary Hart and a backwards walking Dragon Master which um, I actually thought I was looking at him and thinking is that Curtis Hughes this can't be Curtis Hughes. And he was walking back. Anyway, that yeah, one's something yeah. I'd completely forgotten about. And then <laughs> Bruno Sammartino, a little guy who had a bit of success in the wrestling business that I'm sure you may have heard of one time or another. Philly loves him, of course. Uh, he just quit the WWF. He'd been a commentator uh, up until maybe about 88 there. And then, you know... We, uh, he had many falling outs with Vince over the years well, for various little, different reasons. A little texture to that, you know, him having the falling out uh, and being an announcer to that time. That was the vestige of the heat between his son David and him. Uh, David, uh, he did not want David in the business, and David just at some point, 20, 21 years old, said he's going to do it. And Bruno said, okay, can do everything I tell you. And to get him into the WWF, they made him sign a contract for so many wrestling matches, like four or six matches per year and commentating until 88, 89, whatever it was. And uh, and then David leaves and you know, just up and walks out of quits one day and Bruno stuck under this contract. And it, it, it was sad because uh, you know, Bruno went to his grave and he and his son had never reconciled. And I find that heartbreaking to, 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 to know. What was the fallout between Bruno and David? Was it about steroids or was it something else? No. No, it was that David, uh, he, like I said, he didn't want David in the business. And uh, at, at some age as an adult, David just informed him he's going to do it with or without him. Yeah. And Bruno knew that without him, you know, a lot of people had heat with Bruno because, you know, he had been that top guy for so long and everything. Uh, I don't mean like heat, like they hated his guts. It was just that he was always that top guy holding everybody, not holding everybody down, just blocking everybody because he was so, so successful. Uh to get him into the WWF with Vince Jr., uh, they they made him sign a contract that it was either four or six actual matches per year and then doing the commentary, I think, for two or three years. And so David, about 10 weeks in, I think it was, uh, is wrestling Big Raw and Shaw in, I think, Philadelphia. Yeah. And he, he has him body slam him 10 times, and he pins him. David jumps right up, walks to the back, grabs his bag, and walks out. And Bruno's stuck in this contract. And uh, that was part of it. I'm sure there were other issues as well. And I know a few others that were personal to the family. Uh, but I find, as a father, I find it heartbreaking that these two couldn't find common ground. Just, just that, you know, proud Italian heritage that they're just, you know, no, nope, he's dead to me, dead to me, that kind of thing. And, and just sad, you know, it's because uh, both of them are really good guys. Well, I'm looking here. I mean, David Sammartino, I know he had that Ron Shaw that actually had Ron Shaw as a guest, in fact, uh, a, a couple of years ago. And uh, I think Ron was giving the uh, the uh, in-character answer for that. But, yes. I mean, like David Sammartino's 84, you know, he's actually given a bit of a shove in the early days. And it was, you know, I realise it's mostly contingent on Bruno working, whether yeah. David 
uh, does well or not. And then he's there for 85, he's there for 86, and then... But then he keeps he keeps turning back up. He turns up in 87 for a, 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 for a summer, it looks like. And then he even has a few matches in 88 as well. So that's why it's a bit confusing with me, because Bruno's stuck in the contract, I understand that. But David yeah. does keep coming back. And the last yeah, match which... we've got here is David Sammartino being, <laughs> losing to, in a dark match, Steve Blackman in 88, yeah. who had a very wow. brief uh, couple of dark matches. He was about to get signed, Blackman, then he ended up doing a tour and getting sick for yeah. six years or something crazy like that. Sure. Well, I, I think, and again, this is just a guess on my part, but understanding how the contracts work. You walking out doesn't break that contract. So I'm sure Bruno on the inside was trying to play ambassador between those two and getting him back in at certain places and then you know something else goes awry. Or, uh, David, for his part, I think what he did wrong, and I've said this about David Flair, uh, uh, Eric Watts to some degree, coming in under, you know, if your dad's name is Rick Flair, if your dad's name is Bruno San Martino, if your dad's name is Bill Watts or whatever, I mean, th th these are huge casting shadows in the industry. Uh, and you're going to be held to a standard that's probably far more stringent than I was held uh, or maybe Pillman or, or Zank were held uh, because we don't have that pedigree. They will never, ever be able to overshadow their, you know, world famous parents. And Dave, if you go back and watch those matches, uh, A, he was much smaller than Bruno, like 230, 235, great shape, but much smaller than Bruno. But he was trying to wrestle like Bruno, you know, the knees to the head and, the, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And it just didn't translate. Uh, and I think in large part because Bruno just was, let's face it, one of the largest shadows in our industry, uh, history of our industry. So uh, that would be my guess as to why it kept popping back up because it couldn't work anywhere else. You know, Vince it would typically be a three-year contract uh, once signed. So that would be my guess, and I'm sure there's something connected to that with it. You know, now with Bruno, uh, he actually wanted. I'm sorry, he was offered by WCW to do commentary the next year, and he just said, "I don't want to do the travel. I'm happy to do an appearance like this." Yeah. And. Just because you mentioned before, Bruno was on commentary for quite a few years doing superstars and everything. And I say on commentary, it was Vince and Jesse. And then Bruno would say something for about 20 seconds at the end. And then it was the other two again. So it was, he was completely wasted. He was there for the Northeast crowd, I'm sure. Right, but right. having said that, why did Bruno and Vince McMahon have such a bitter dispute for so long? What was the, what was the main thing that was the issue between them? Steroids was, was the number one issue. Uh, uh, the second issue was he just didn't like where wrestling had gone. Um, you know, and I, I think we, you know, we all have suffered that malady, right? We, we remember the industry, we remember it. And then it morphs into something else. Uh, you know, Bruno, like I, I mentioned before, he, he never quite understood ECW. Uh, you know, he was always respectful to it. But he would say, yeah, but why, you know, you should be, if you're in the audience for three minutes, you should be counted out. And, you know, why this and why that? And if I, I realized no matter what I said, it was going to get him to see it. Uh, so I said, well, come on, Bruno, to be fair, you guys had a green, a guy with a green tongue eating turnbuckles. And, and he uh, sort of chuckled and shrugged it off. Uh, you know, the, the industry was, especially then, I mean, it's still, it's always in a state of flux and changing to something else. But wrestling had gone from black boots and black tights, smoke-filled rooms with a few lights above the ring, to massive arenas and stadiums, feather boa wearing, rock music entering. I, I mean, it was just like dark ages to Technicolor, and uh, and and Bruno was a vestige of that old school, you know, and and you know, perfect for that time. I don't know. I, I I I'm certain Bruno would know how to get over today because Bruno really understood the nuances of our business. And if he were wrestling today, he would know how to manipulate that to his favor. Uh, but he, like all of us, we have that one foot in where we came from in the business and what we remembered and loved about the business and what we learned and then spewed out for the business after that. Uh, Bruno just couldn't make that connection and, and make that leap. The steroids was the biggest. And when he uh, announced, when he made the deal to finally go to the Hall of Fame, the deal was he got to announce it in Pittsburgh on local media the night before WWF released the information. And I was watching Channel 2 News, KDKA News in Pittsburgh that night, and I see you know, this is how I learned that Bruno was going to the Hall of Fame. 
And they interviewed him briefly and he said, you know, well, you know, the steroids and he said, but they've assured me that's all been taken care of. And, and I knew it was a lie. And so I called Bruno right up and I said, you know, Bruno's you know, heads up on this. And uh, I think, that, you know, that Bruno's not a dumb guy, an incredibly smart guy, especially to our business. I'm sure he knew in the back of his head, you know, what a guy looks like that's on steroids versus not. Uh, but I think he wanted to, and he certainly deserved to enjoy his acceptance into the Hall of Fame instead of posthumously, right? And I think that was, well, in my humble opinion, it was Bruno's way of putting that me a cop up. Yeah, yeah, I'm going in, but they assured me this. And uh, because when I talked to him, like Bruno would, you know, it was always a good long conversation and Bruno would ask questions. And typically if it, I would have thought when I mentioned that to him, he would have said, well, what makes you think that? What do you know that I don't? That, you know, he would dig into it and just not jump to conclusions. And he asked none of that in that conversation. So I backed right off and thought he knows what he's doing. And, uh, you know, and certainly, like I said, deserved to, 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 uh, bask in, in, in the, in the, uh, the entertainment of being involved and accepted into the hall of fame because he certainly deserved to be there. Don Morocco, when I was doing the podcast with him, always said that another bone of contention between Bruno and Vince originally was when Bruno had the Pittsburgh territory. And there were issues between those two over that. So I don't know if that's anything you and Bruno ever talked about. Yeah, uh, I, that was called international wrestling, uh, and it, it aired for a couple of weeks. Everybody knows, and you know my love and respect for Bruno. It was a like you had mentioned about uh, Brickhouse Brown and like being a, a vestige of a bygone era. International wrestling looked just like that. It looked like an old tape from late 1962. And, it, you know, and they, production, they had the money for production and all of that. Uh, so, yeah, but I, I, and I'm sure Vince probably did step toes on that because you could see a lot of the guys that were involved in that were Bruno and Dominic's compatriots. And, you know, they probably wanted some of them for agents and, you know, other things to come in, plus to keep Pittsburgh under his wing. Because this is in the earliest years of, of uh, Vince taking over and preparing to build this juggernaut called WrestleMania and, WWF, WWE. So, the Thunderdome cage match. It is... I've written overbooked and confusing. <laughs> and it sort yes. of was. It, it, there's there's a, a Terminator. So, this is Ole Anderson and who's managing... And, and Gary Hart. They're the Terminators. They both have a towel. And it's, you know, whoever throws the towel in for their team, etc. And then the Thunderdome is also apparently electrified. At any point while watching this match, did you see anyone get electrified on it? <laughs> was it was it made clear to you when you watched this that this was definitely going to be electrified? No, I mean, it, 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 see, again, that, it, it's, it's just so reflective of WCW at this time. You know, you know like <clears throat> first of all, the, the phrase "Terminators." <clears throat> at this time, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie is very well known, and uh, you know, you got two guys on the outside and throwing a towel and doesn't quite, it's not very Terminator esque, yeah. you know, that, you know, and, and, and the naming of it, but they would just throw this stuff out there. Like, Oh, let's say the, the ring's electrified and there's a pit of sharks underneath it and this and that we're never going to show it. So we don't have to worry about it and not realizing that for the wrestlers going in there and, you know, actually working inside that ring, it's a, and I think if you, let's go down that vein for a second, let's say the wrestlers were pretending it was electrified. That would have been a little bit like Laurel and Hardy, wouldn't it? Like getting zapped, like zipping around the ring and everything, uh, almost like the bug zapper. And, you're, and knowing WCW, they probably would have uh, panned in some loud, eh, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, like the operation game. I, it, it, you know, those, those things they would do like that. And you'd wonder, it, 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 it's like my criticism of Dixie, like this talking down to the fans, like the fans, oh, they're so stupid, don't buy that. They just say it and then put no thought into it, whether the workers are selling that or, you know, the, the, you have an electrician down at ringside ready to cut the power, whatever, because it's now going to take resources, not many, but it's going to take some number of dollars to, to put that in and make it work that way. And instead of just not saying it, you know, it's a steel cage. And uh, what I didn't like about the cage, and I've never liked about cages, is when they have the cage on the floor like that, and then there's this area around the ring you can walk. 
because, A, it's very difficult to shoot. You know, it's difficult for the wrestlers to move around in. You can't use the cage from inside the ring because it's three feet away, four feet away. It just makes uh, for an odd-looking stage as opposed to, you know, like the, the, the traditional style cage where, you know, it's literally 12 inches past the rope. And, uh, you know, the other part of this is that steel, that's a, that's a like legit steel bars. Like that wasn't a, a you know, rubber cage or whatever. <laughs> uh, and yet you have, you know, the guys trying to utilize it, but they, they, again, they can't get to it. But the few places they did, and yet we see, you know, a lack of color and, you know, this whole idea of the electrified ring and everything. It just made the whole thing seem so cartoonish you know and, and, and approach and that was the comical thing about that or the sad thing about it is that at the time wcw was trying to draw the parallel between them and wwe or f then uh that they're the entertaining guys they're the cartoon guys ours are the wrestler guys and yet we see this kind of stuff you know and it's just cornball looking it's funny that you mentioned actually that the cage that encompasses the entire ring and then some of the floor as well but we see this in hell in a cell now which uses it yep. to great effect because it's the entire floor so yes. you've got room to move and uh, room to work i've seen cages like uh we we're talking about the thunder Dam, but yep. i've seen other cages similar where it sort of cuts half of the ring apron off so then the outside mm. you can't really do anything and then yep. yeah as you say it can look a bit cumbersome but also because i'm so glad you mentioned this about you know the the cage and the production of it i've never seen a cage match live in an audience i've seen a good few wrestling matches and shows and everything but never a cage match do you think a cage match hurts the audience enjoyment because depending on the sort of configuration of the bars or the mesh or whatever people are constantly trying to move and trying to see what's going on if they're like far away sure yeah it's you know again that's an old steamboat thing right sell to the guy in the last row he's got the crappiest seat in the place but if he can see and what you're selling, everybody in between is going to. But you're right. You know, when I think of what you're talking about there, I think of like when I would go to concerts as a kid, they would have obstructed view seats, yeah. right? And sit down as a big pillar right here. <laughs> you're trying to see the concert. Uh, yeah, I, I, it, it is cumbersome. I think it's fine for television or pay-per-views because you've got a camera that can get up tight and, and show the, the, you know, the point of view. Uh, but in, you know, in some place like, like uh, you know, the larger arenas and larger stadiums, like the PPG building in Pittsburgh uh, holds, I think, 20, 21,000. It's a gigantic arena and far bigger than the old Center Green, about four or 5,000 seats. And I'd taken my kids to see Green Day there a few years back. And same thing, you know, we didn't have horrible seats. But I mean, they, the, the people on the, on the stage look this big. It was like you're like looking through a telephoto lens or something. Uh, so yes, it definitely obstructs the view. And keep in mind, you've got thousands and thousands of people. Also, the guy in front of you is doing this, you know. And so you keep trying to find the sweet spot. Uh, yeah, and that cage in particular, because the old style cages, you know, like the fencing cage, uh, from a distance, it's almost like the the, the cage disappears. You, you still pretty well see through that. But these heavy bars and corners and roofs and everything on this thing uh, uh, just certainly detracts from the viewership of it. And I, I just one thing pointed out, out in here, those kind of rings when they started raising, you know, popping up in the business in the 80s uh, in, in Galveston, Texas, that's where Sting blew his knee out because he was running down, uh, running, and there was, I forget who was in the ring working. Sting went running down and went to make, like, take a leap to jump onto the cage so he could climb up it. But well, one of those legit steel bars hit him right in the kneecap and tore his knee. Mm. Um, you know, so they could also be dangerous because, again, we're used to working in the other kind. And then you go into something like that. And I agree with you, Hell in a Cell setting up the premise like that. And then you had guys like Mick and, and Undertaker that set that standard and later Sean you know, could go in and really utilize the cage in a way that we hadn't seen it used before. But this is these cages had just made their debut and, you know, not the best effort from WCW. Yeah. There was also uh, bits of um, eph ephemera stuff on the tops as yeah. well to, like, make it a bit more spooky, I guess, for Halloween. But I, all I was thinking was about the some guy up in the, up in the rafters who that is just the sweet spot of blocking the entire ring for them i was thinking <laughs> yes. of. um i'll ask you a couple of more questions about this and then do you know we could probably i'll probably shorten the next episode you know so we sort of compensate for it but 
I'm going to ask this. Great Muta is one of those rare Japanese stars that was actually Japanese-based, instead of, you know, being fully American-based or whatever, but would turn up once every few years, and it was always a big deal. He'd do that in the, like, 80s in WCW all the way till, well, like, 2000 WCW, I think he was doing that. Yeah. Um, Why... Why Great Muta? Why was he always, one, treated with respect by the WCW office, and two, why do the fans love him over here? Well, a couple re- the, the reason for the respect from the office is WCW and prior, the NWA, was trying to keep a forged relationship with uh, all Japan. And so to reciprocate that, you know, Muta was a huge star in Japan, but if we can take him to America for a year, year and a half, uh, then bring him back. He's fresh, mm-hmm. and 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 he's gotten over in America too. It's like you know, music. Uh, you know, Beatles hit big in, in in England. That's great, and Europe. But America was the market you had to break. Uh, the same thing with Japanese wrestling. They were seeing the Japanese were seeing this as the opportunity to showcase their amazing talent in America and give a foothold there. As far as the talent uh, and how you know why did Mood always get over was because he was so damn good. Uh, you know, everything, like when he does his moonsault, he, you know, he, he would do that thing where he'd get up and hold the, the turnbuckle, and then when he'd let go, it was almost like a diver in the Olympics. You'd see him snap, you know, out of crop, you know, crouched position, snap his arms and legs would come over, and then he would do this layout thing where it just, you know, just beautifully, boom, it just it was perfect. I I used to, and I think other people in wrestling you saw always call him uh, Japan's Bret Hart. Because Brett, everything Brett did was so crisp and so right. You know, it just looked right. And Muda, the same thing. Uh, and also, and I know I say this all the time, Muda was a good guy. Like, he enjoyed having him around and talking with him and uh, and watching him. Uh, I remember the first time I in WCW, and I, he's in and I'm watching him and he goes to the ring. And I caught myself, it's not often, but I'll catch myself with a sort of, look on my face, like just watching him and just absorbing it, you know, and just, wow, this is incredible. Because like, again, at this time, we were seeing very, very little of Japanese wrestling. You can get a tape here and there and that kind of stuff. But it was at this time, because of guys like Muda, uh, that, you know, that door started opening. And uh, American distributors started realizing, hey, there's a market here. We can, we can make money with this. And uh, I've always said this about the Japanese wrestlers, you know, in, in America – any Tom, Dick, and Harry can start a wrestling school. It doesn't matter if they have pedigree in the business or not. Just slap a ring up and you know, you know, an old building, whatever. And you got it. You're wrestling. You own a wrestling school. In Japan, when you hear the phrase dojos, those are legitimate places. And, it, you know, in those places, in those dojos, those young boys are taught respect. Uh, you know, the Japanese culture is huge on respect. And I remember the first time going to Japan in 1988, uh, a, a kid then, who would become one of the major stars in the early in the late mid to late nineties and early two thousands? Tenta Kabashi, good guy, big thick uh, Japanese guy. Uh, and on that first tour, I see him in the middle of the dressing room after the show. I come back from the ring, and he's down on his knees, pan of water there, and he's scrubbing, literally, literally scrubbing Baba's feet mm. and drying them and everything. Had he not done that, you know that's. That's their way of tearing down your ego to now when you step into that place and you've earned your respect, uh, something I, I, I really love and respect about the uh, Japanese culture. Uh, because in, in our country, the, the old guys like Dominic did it a different way. <laughs> Never had to scrub his uh, grapes, thump and feet. But he uh, he would do it another way, teach you the respect like that, making you set the ring up and tear it down and do this and do that. Uh but all of those things, whether it was the way I'd seen Kenta Kabashi do it, or the way Dominic made us do it, uh, and then this, like the stories about Matt Suda, you know, intentionally hurting like Hogan, see if he came back. Uh, those are all meant to instill to you. First of all, before we reveal to you the secrets of our industry, before we open the doors wide open and allow you to see how we cut the lady in half, we're going to make darn sure you have respect for the business. And to do that, you've got to tear ego down first and then build the respect on top of it. And uh, that would be the reason that Moody got over so well, because he had come up in that system and it just had to steal a phrase from, from Brett, the excellence of execution, Japanese style. Okay, to the Thunderdome match itself. The big thing here is there's a rope in one corner of the cage that Stink was swinging back and forth on, I seem to remember, into Terry Funk, uh, but then gets his leg tied up somehow in the cage. Then Ole tries to 
get him free. He'll uh, get Flair with a stuffed pile driver. They love the old uh, double pile drivers in this episode. Uh, Ric Flair puts his hands down. Here's something I didn't notice, and we'll be very quick on this, is that I've never, ever seen anyone apart from Ric Flair take a pile driver where he puts his hands on the mat before, like, you know, the sit-down portion happens. So he's essentially doing a handstand. Uh, uh, just yeah. uh, paranoia about getting hurt, I guess, or something else. Well, it's not paranoia. It's, it, it's again, like the generations, mine and before, were taught safety first. And uh, I, in my match with Paul Orndorff in 84 at WWF, I did the same thing, but he has such thick thighs that I'm, my hands are on his thighs. So I, I, I'm, I know that with my hands on his thighs, as thick as his legs are, there's no chance. Because even though I start to feel my head touch the mat, I can pop out. But it also allows you to, to get that pogo stick look. You know, it just looks like a boing, like you've been – like your whole vertebra had just been crushed. Uh, and, and, you know, Flair was one of those guys. And I think that's part of what I don't think. I know it's what part, a big part of what made him so great was it was those little tiny things like that that the, our trained eye would see that he's doing. But it also then oversells it to the audience. You know, and so Rick was always able to take everything that was here and elevate it ever so much, just a, a bit more that makes it memorable in your head. I also remember seeing the footage. I don't know if you've ever seen this footage, but when and uh, I'm just saying letters now at you. When Ric Flair, yes. NWA champion, is against I don't know if it's I'm not sure if it's Victor Javica or the other guy. I don't. I think it's the other guy who's in um, Trinidad. Let's say. Yeah. And anyway, they dot to the footage to where the guy wins the NWA heavyweight title because Ric Flair was so scared about being killed over there that you just said just pin me hold the belt up give me the belt back afterwards which is what <laughs> happened but uh he actually takes the pile driver the same way he does it you know his hands right on the mat there's no chance of his head coming anywhere close to danger and right. i was that's the only person i've ever seen do it as a little aside um a three count was never actually administered the uh ridiculous editing job is the referee counted one and they just repeated that one count three times <laughs> Oh, wow. It's wow. awful, but you'd have to see it for yourself. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's it's astonishing artifact, let me tell you. Um, it was reported that prior to the Baltimore Great American Bash, that Sting refused to put Terry Funk over. This is 1989 again. And Sting got away with changing the finish, even though Funk needed a big win going into his feud with Ric Flair. Is there any truth to this with Sting not being amenable to doing jobs back in the day? Ever heard of this? Uh, well, not just Sting. I, I think that that was the the beginning of the cancer in WCW, right? Like, first of all, they had this ridiculous booking committee. Uh, on paper, sounds great. Instead of one guy making all the decisions, now you have all that meant was that chair is going to take care of the stuff they're involved in. That chair is going to protect their stuff. Flair is going to protect his stuff. Uh, and at, at this time, I, I and I wouldn't be, even though I eschew that kind of stuff in our industry, uh, because I do believe it's a cancer. It's it's truly letting the, inma the inmates run the asylum. Uh, but you're only judged to, to the peers that are on the tier you're on. And so it, this is when we start to see also around this time frame where, you know, Flair would pick Sting up and suplex him and Sting would stand right up. Well, the Road Warriors weren't going to let that go on in them because now they sell it and that means Sting's tougher than them. So they wouldn't sell that. And then the next big guy wouldn't sell it. And then the next big guy and the next big guy. I remember that one time when we were working with the Twin Towers, uh, Johnny Ace and I, uh, Brian, uh, or, uh, uh, he was in the ring with uh, uh, Danny Spivey. And it was like pulling teeth trying to set this match up. And he, Johnny wanted to call a spot where he would Irish whip Spivey into the ropes. And Spivey goes, ah, I don't think you should Irish whip me. I'm too big. And Johnny goes, you're too, you're, you're too 70. I'm too 60. You've got me by an inch. You know, suddenly the physical. And, but again, this is where this came from. All the other big guys aren't being Irish whipped, so I can't be Irish whipped either. And that would be my guess as to what happened. I don't, I can't say that I ever heard that Sting refused, but that would be very consistent with what was going on in that division, that top tier of guys. Uh, because now, you know, you got guys like us in the, in the mid card that are bumping our asses off and selling, you know, everything. And, you know, now Steiner can't sell it. Now the Road Warriors can't sell it. The Twin Towers can't sell it. And that means Doom can't sell it because, and it just sweeps through like a prairie fire.
it, it, that would have been very indicative at that time. And I agree with the booking, that, 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 as, as you suggested, that if Terry was getting ready to go into this singles angle with Funk or with Flair, uh, that he needed that big propel when to propel him into that. Uh, there was, there was some, uh, personally, I experienced that, but not in WCW. Uh, I was working with one of the aforementioned guys, uh, and there was this like foot drag, like when they gave the finish, I'm like, oh, no. and it bothered me because I'd known this guy for quite a while. And I went to his hotel room after, and I said, I, is there a problem with putting me over? You know, because I, Again, like, I'm not really winning and you're not really losing, right? It's, it's like, bang, in the movie. Well, I can't shoot me because I'm, I'm made of stone, so you can't shoot me. Um, it, it just, again, this is where this whole thing in WCW just went, just haywire, you know? And so, and, you know, and then guys like Pillman, you know, would start to think, well, if they're not going to sell it, why am I going to sell it? And, you know, it just became this, you know, like this cancer that metastasized through the dressing room like like prairie fire burning through it and this is where we start to get these kind of inane pointless gray area finishes that really gets nobody over and to the detriment to probably everybody in the ring uh when you go back and you watch booking from paul and everybody knows where i stand with paul but you know it, it, you, you're spitting in the wind and you'll be a fool or like you're embellishing or lying if you say he's not a great booker because he was um, where, you know, he would take a segment. There was a segment out of uh, 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 Elks Lodge, uh, Madhouse of Extreme, where Bam Bam was wrestling Spike Dudley and having a great match with him, as he always did. And then Tammy and Chris hit the ring. Then Franny and I hit the ring. Then Taz came to the ring. Or, or, I'm sorry, uh, Sabu came to the ring. And there was just uh, this constant like waves hitting the beach that each time was ramping up, ramping up, ramping up. Finally, in the midst of their angle, Sabu and Taz, Taz hits. And T Sabu is at this point on the floor against the railing and Taz comes running over. You can tell he's getting ready to throw a clothesline or a punch and Paul freezes it and we fade out to something else. Watch that segment. Every single talent in that segment comes out worth more than they went in with. That is n damn near impossible to book uh, because somebody obviously has to lay down and you know somebody has to be elevated in, in the traditional sense. But when you get creative with the booking, you can't do that every segment or two or three times a show. But when you do do it and everybody walks back to the dressing room, worth more walking out. Uh, that's just, you know again, kudos on the booking. It's the kind of stuff that always kept my attention because that's not easy to do. Now, Sting and Muta fumble around on the cage for quite a while afterwards. Flair gets Funk in the figure four. Sting splashes him. Muta tries to chop Bruno for some reason, which uh, I understand why, but it, it, it just yeah. seems to sort of come out of a uh, left field. Uh, chop goes right over the head of Bruno, and Bruno doesn't duck whatsoever. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I thought that was quite funny. And then Bruno, you know, gets his big moment and suddenly punches Muta. Gary Hart wanders in and gets nailed by Oli. Hart drops the towel. He sort of goes like, Bleh! you know, that kind of thing, and then yeah. flings the towel. Uh, yeah. Bruno sees it and calls for the match, so Sting and Ric Flair win by termination decision. War Pigs plays in the background fairly clearly, which I thought that was something that the network didn't pick up, which I, I, always, like to, I always like to pick up those little things. Commentators yes. take us out and credits roll. Now, <clears throat> Jim Ross, as we're being taken out here, specifically says that Starcade is coming up, and we hope that this cable company will carry it. Now, you were there living it at the time. This was around the time that the WWF and WCW were screwing each other over on pay-per-view by running free events opposite each other on TV against a pay-per-view. That's how Clash of the Champions 1 was born, of course. Right. I think there was like a bunkhouse stampede where that kind of thing was happening as well. Then Vince at one point was threatening, hey, if you carry Starcade, for example, then you won't get WrestleMania 4 or 5, or that kind of thing. What do you yes. remember of the time of WCW and WWF basically just trying to screw with each other's business to the point that the pay-per-view companies had to step in and say, stop it? Yeah. Again, you know, when our business uh, descends to its lowest common denominator, uh, it looks so cheesy and so cheap and so small-minded. Uh, you know, like I remember when WCW would uh, 
release the finishes. Hey, if you're watching, you want to flip over, hey, Mick Foley just lost to so-and-so. Uh, a, you're spending your television time and talking about the other guy. That's the, the big problem with it. The second problem is the fans don't really care. You know, they, 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 you two are ha- these two entities are having this tip. They just want a good product. And so focus on your product. Uh, it, 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 to me, again, it just made it, it, at this point, you can already see the early, you know, the, there's the old saying, it's already dead. The body hasn't hit the floor. You, you can see this in these matches and stuff and suddenly compare that this, you know, this uh, Halloween habit, compare that to previous pay-per-views in the NWA and WCW. And you can clearly see that there's been this off ramp and heading sort of like into sports entertainment. Well, it's always been my, my, my fervent belief that let Vince be sports entertainment because there's a shit ton of wrestling fans out there that don't like sports entertainment and their money's as green as those guys that like sports entertainment. Focus on them, make them yours. And, and yet our business just can't seem to do that. And, and, and these cheesy, uh, uh, the, you know, the revealing of the finishes and then Vince, you know, hegemonizing and going in and saying, uh, hey, if you carry that, you're not going to get this. And uh, I, I'd be very curious to talk to antitrust lawyers in, in America uh, when you're screwing with uh, in America. The belief is is a free market uh, system where if you're selling hamburgers and I'm selling hamburgers and I'm trying to do something to undermine your business, you're son- trying to undermine my business. If we're the only two burger joints in the country. Well, the, the the customer wins out when there's multiple choices. Price stays down, uh, quality goes up because we got to compete on other things. And I, I don't know how, in God's name, the WWF was allowed to purchase WCW and uh, and it not be considered a monopoly. Because you know, you look at the number of wrestlers that were employed previous in the uh, in the uh, territory days, uh, the exodus, the hemorrhaging of, of careers. Uh, number numbers wise, and then like the night that WWF bought actually bought, I was home with my hand and th- my thumb in a cast, and I just turned the TV on, getting ready to sit down and watch WCW, and I see Vince or Shane McMahon. I went, oh, sure, went to the wrong ad- not channel, so I clicked over to the other channel. Same thing, you know. But maybe four or five times, I'm like, I'm banging the microphone with the the, uh, the remote, or what the hell's wrong with my remote? And then it hit me, holy shit, they're on both channels. And we had heard nothing. We'd heard earlier a rumor that they were buying, and then that fell through. And so this came from like left field. Uh, but you know, it's it's very clearly been a monopoly. Uh, yeah, I can go out and work for Appalachian Championship Wrestling or this, you know, Bobby Fulton or whoever uh, around, but I can't make a living with these guys like I could with the other companies. And so how they were able to manage and pull that off, you know, I'm sure there was dirty money somewhere, but you know, favors called in, whatever. But this is the reason I think when you look and you see like when Bill Watts at the tail end of UFC was uh, AWOL because uh, he was out and Eddie was running pretty much the booking because he was out trying to get investors so that he could compete with Vince. When you're the top dog like that and, and the, the, the 900 pound elephant in the industry, you can call a star, you know, an HBO or a pay-per-view company and say, hey, carry this. You're not going to get WrestleMania. Uh, but again, that's just reeks of, of uh, monopolization and it's to the detriment of the fans. It's to the detriment of the workers. It's to the detriment of the, of the networks because now they're being forced to make a choice. The only person is the one entity making out would have been WWF. So uh, the, by my definition, the textbook example of monopolization, uh, but there was a, a lot of this cutthroat stuff going and WCW did itself no favors by going to these what we would call dusty finish in this kind of a match. And you have this guy uh, allegedly claiming that they're going to lay down to that guy. It's like, imagine getting on a movie set and this is a scene where you get shot today and you, uh, I can't let him shoot me. I mean, I have, you know, and I can't this, and I, but that has to come before or after this. You, you're going to be right off that set. You're going to be replaced uh, because this is what the movie is. This is what the, the company calls for. If you don't like that, then you don't take the rule. But uh, the same thing in our industry. And unfortunately, because our industry is predicated and built upon large personalities and, and people getting over, well, if I dump all of my exposure time on you and none on wrestler B, that's the greatest wrestler that's ever lived, 
if you never see the greatest wrestler that ever lived, then just putting all my attention on you, well, he's not really the greatest wrestler that ever lived, then you are. And it's just where our business, instead of going to legitimacy and naively when I came into the business, I had always thought, if you can put asses in the seats, you're going to have a job, right? <laughs> not so much. It's, uh, you know, the business has been replete with that over the last several decades. And I think in some ways we're still seeing those things rear its head, right? You know, look at the the, the, the backstage brawl we had in AEW and this other stuff. It's like you, you, somebody has to be the boss. You know, if you're going to sit down and put all these egos into a, into a building and light the fuse, of course it's going to blow sooner or later. Somebody has to stand up and be the adult in the room and say, sorry, James, this is the way it is. If you don't like it, there's the door. You know, I'd love to have you stay here, but – and when's the last time you heard that in wrestling? When you were saying at the beginning of when you started talking then, you said, hey, let them do sports entertainment. We do pro wrestling. <clears throat> when WCW yeah. shut, I think there was an arrogance on Vince McMahon's part saying, hey, well, you know, there's no one running against us now. All those fans will migrate over. They didn't. Yes. And then TNA was born out of trying to find the lost WCW fan, and they didn't find the lost WCW fan either. I mean, right. so many people wanted that style of wrestling that they kept trying to get away from. <clears throat> when I interviewed Tully Blanchard a couple of months ago, it's, uh, he wasn't in the same building because it was, it was in a hotel, wasn't it? But um, yes. he said the same thing when he was in WCW or NWA. He was like, why are we trying to copy them? Let's just us yes. be us, because it was working for decades beforehand. It's what the fans want. But, just, yes. but uh, yeah, it's, it's horses for courses, but I don't think anyone at the time really seemed to realize that. Yeah, well, and there was also historical precedent to that in our industry and not from ancient history. Uh, when Jim Crockett and the NWA bought UWF, yeah. the UWF, the NWA was already available to those viewers in, in Carolinas and Oklahoma and Texas and uh, Alabama and Louisiana. Uh, that, that was already available. So they spent something like $8.4 million bucks, which essentially worked out to being two or three ring trucks and I think three or four rings. Because all the TV contracts that Bill had signed up the UWF, within a month, two or three, as the ratings kept going, jettisoned it, jettisoned it, jettisoned it. And they did the absolute worst thing you could do when they bought uh, UW, UWF uh, was that they came in. There was the uh, what was called the massacre in New Orleans, right, where they have all of us coming in. I think it was me and Ron Simmons versus uh, Luger and Flair. Uh, and every one of us was going and getting slaughtered by the NWA guys. And, the, and those fans in that area that grew up watching Mid-South and UWF and loving it said, well, I can already get this on Superstation, click. And they were turning it off. So th there was precedent to this already in our industry. And again, just from a few years previous. And it, apparently nobody's paying attention to our own industry's history. <laughs> nope. Those who ignore history, et cetera, et cetera, doomed to repeat it. I'm going to give you a few bits of post-Halloween Havoc 89 news. Yes. Terry Funk was recently returning from suspension, quote-unquote, after the plastic bag incident that keeps coming up when we talk about it, actually, recently. <laughs> and would go on to lose to Flair at Clash of the Champions and their legendary I Quit match. Elsewhere, the big angle is the genius Lanny Poffo defeating Hulk Hogan via disqualification on a Saturday night's main event and Mr. Perfect smashing up Hogan's belt with a hammer. The reformation of Akira Maeda's UWF is the success story of the year. New Japan announces shows to be run in the Soviet Union, which I thought was a funny little tidbit. Uh, Continental yeah. Wrestling Association, aka Memphis, would cease to be and later take the name of the USWA, which Dallas had already renamed itself when Jerry Jarrett took over because they were like WCWA for a brief period. It's very confusing. And then Dallas would exit USWA with some lawsuits thrown in in September 1990, so about 10 months after this pay-per-view, and revert back to world-class name before shutting up shop a couple of months later. Jim Cornette then would turn on the dynamic dudes a couple of weeks after this pay-per-view. And at the very, uh, at the very well-regarded Clash 9 knockout in New York, fully expecting to turn the Midnight Express fully heel, that did not happen. So to close out this show... And I don't think we've ever talked about it. If we did, we sort of talked about it partially. Didn't fully delve into it. So the last question I'll ask you is, what you remember of Jim Cornette turning on the dynamic dudes, and what did you expect to happen with the reaction of the crowd? Uh, well, in that town, exactly what happened. Uh, it was definitely a heel town. If, I'm, if memory serves correct, and I'm pretty certain it does in this case, 
we were told that, uh, and I believe from Jim Ross, that the, the company had felt that they had gotten as much as they could out of Cornette with Midnight. Like they'd run all the different storylines could possibly run. And it was a way to sort of re-energize Corny and uh, and give uh, 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 Midnight Express some new life, which in you know, the match we saw them as baby faces, I thought was just awful. I, it just wasn't Midnight Express. Um, by this time, though, and we, and, you know, we come down to this this final point for this angle between Midnight and the dudes and Cornette stuck somewhere in between. And we learned that it was Corny turning on us. It, it was it, you, it didn't take a brain surgeon in this business to figure out this was a swerve on their part, uh, you know, because it made us look young and dumb. And, you know, and that to me was always the stuff with, with wrestling booking that angered me. I'm a, I'm a big boy. Uh, so I can count all the way to 20 if I can take my shoes off. Just come to me and tell me what you need. I'm the actor that's going to get shot in this scene today. This is the, the scene we're shooting. Uh, you don't have to lie to me. You don't have to manipulate me. Uh, and and I can probably work a lot better and give you what you want if you're honest and upfront with me. But this is not how the industry then or now apparently worked. So, you know, instead of seeing, I again, my naivete from coming from small podunk Beaver County, Pennsylvania, uh, I believe that if you were the guy that went in was he, you know, did what the boss asked you to do. You worked hard for the boss. You did what it's asked of you. You're contributing and, and you know, giving ideas and everything else. I just assumed that'd be the guy I'd want to work with, you know, instead of the pain in the ass. Oh, God, it's James complaining again. Okay, James, let's rub your tootsies for you and take care of you. Uh, and it wasn't that way. It's not that way. And I think it's it's to the, to the uh, detriment of our business and our product. When you have somebody... Stay Hulk Hogan because, and, I, and I'm not picking on him. I'm just using him because we've heard this so often, and I'd seen it so often from him. Well, I'm not laying down for them. I'm not laying down for them. Add it back to the comments about, uh, you know, about uh, you know not being willing to work with or put somebody over. Uh, this becomes just a cancer that e eats its way through. And in a business that's a work, uh, you, you know, you can see how. That would spread. Like if I, well, if I can get away with it, if they can get away with it, why can't I get away with it? And you know, at some point, you get down far enough on the card where you go, okay, well, we don't really need you that badly, James. So if you don't want to do it, we'll see you. But this part was okay in doing that. Uh, and now you start to get this like two tiered system, right? Well, okay, these guys can get away with this, but we can't. And there's nothing that will tear a wrestling dressing room, locker room apart faster than that. Camps will split up almost immediately. And now instead of everybody, like, I, like you've often heard me talk about the ECW locker room, everybody working together and pushing in the same direction. Now it becomes I'm pushing left, you're pushing right, somebody else is pushing back, somebody else is pushing up. And meanwhile, the product is all over the place. Nobody's giving a consistent product. Uh, WCW's talent roster at this time versus WWF, and I think throughout much of their existence, was the much stronger per wrestling uh, uh, product than WWF. And instead of them capitalizing on their own strength, it's suddenly they're trying to become more like sports entertainment light or junior. And it's, uh, you know, it's the same thing I talked about with David San Martino and David Flair. Don't try to be your dad. That's been done to perfection. You're never going to outdo them at being Flair or Bruno. Uh, the same thing here. Vince, nobody's going to have top Vince or WWE at being WWE and sports entertainment. So go for that different genre. And, and again, the, the 48 to 50 million of them that are still out there and now they're kids and grandkids. My guess is they'll probably spend their money on it, but what the hell would I know? I've only been doing this for 41 years. So it's it's sad. And, like you, and you see at this time, you know, like I remember the pop when Funk finally gave up in the match against Flair. You know, these two guys are starting to get to the second latter half of their of their careers, right? And certainly no longer the primary guys, but they could still go out there and work that crowd. And it's just like ma like a maestro playing an orchestra. Uh, and then you compare that to, you know, the WWF part of the time. Okay, there's some, some good work. You know, they had Brett and they had Kurt. And, you know, there's, you know, a lot of Jake. There's a lot of great workers up there. But in the WWF, those great workers were seen as the tool to get this guy over that's maybe not quite as good as they are. And in WCW, 
they started following that as well. The, the earlier incarnation of NWA and then morphing into WCW was, okay, this kid can go. Let's give like that's why Pillman was hired, right? He, he, by standards of the business that then, uh, he was smaller than me, and I was small in the business. But Jim Ross and the different people that had seen him realized he can get in the ring and do this and go. Tully's not a giant either. There's a lot of guys that weren't giants, but I don't ever remember watching the Four Horsemen and somebody going, "Yeah, but look how short Tully is," or "Look how you know whatever." It's you know there there, there was uh, rap with this because it's a good repeating and final final time. WCW and slash NWA or NWA in parentheses had forgotten all of their strengths and voluntarily flushed them down the drain in this zeal to become better at w at sports entertainment than WWE, which is never going to happen. Vince created it, Vince mastered it, Vince knows what it is. Uh, but I would maintain to my dying breath, there's a lot of fans out there that don't like sports entertainment, that want professional wrestling. And so uh, by and large, for the last 20, uh, what, four years now, uh, for, for like 23, 24 years, our industry has completely forgotten about us that like wrestling and apparently don't want our money and want to continue down that, what today would be termed spot monkey or whatever else. And it's completely baffling to me as to why. To... <clears throat> Focus back on exactly that uh, turn, as it were. How was it presented to you, and how should it have been done to be a successful turn? Or was there no way that you were going to come out on top with Jim Cornette turning on you? Uh, well, I, I had bought into the way it was pitched to us. That you know, that Corny had been at this point what six, seven, eight years with Midnight, uh, the different incarnations. But I'll also say this, Jim Cornette is a phenomenal heel, right? And so I think in my head, uh, and I think John and I even had conversations with this, was, you know, we go with Corny, and or Corny comes with us, whichever way, uh, and now, instead of continuing to be those blah, sugary baby faces, he takes us over to the dark side, and, you know, which was originally Eddie Gilbert's idea to turn us heel. So, uh you know, and I think, you know, I proved a little bit as a heel after that. I'm sure Johnny, uh, you know, his, his natural tendency and personality, much like mine, can be, a you know, acerbic. So uh, I think it would have been a lot more interesting to go that way. But, and that's in no means taking anything away from what Corny and uh, Bobby and Stan created after that with Midnight, because I've always been a huge fan for Midnight Express. Uh, and Corny, his political views aside. <laughs> We shall end it on that political note. So we are going to once again be doing a fan question thing. We normally do it once a month, but this time we're doing it twice a month because, one, we've got so many questions, and, two, we were messed up with like news of Vince McMahon resigning, that little bit of a, a tidbit as well. So next week, questions. If you want your questions submitted for a future episode, write into ShaneDouglasQuestions at gmail.com. Make your... <laughs> Uh, email to that and best questions will make it into the script for the next time we do one of these things but for now thank you very much for watching we'll catch you again next week and Shane take us out now you've heard the second part of Halloween Havoc by coming and sitting under the franchise learning tree see you next week Ow.